Here Good we to are. find that out now. Thanks, Makes Noah. a lot of sense. You're back with Henry, Henry, <laughs> Noah, and Brennan. Hendrix, we're back with Hendrix and Tonic. <laughs> Hendrix and Tonic. So you're back with Henry, Noah, and Brendan. We're going to chat a bit about wine. Um, wine. Now, last time we were doing this, we were talking about, all right, here's your stereotypical person, and mm. I want you to pair a wine to that person. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to switch it up on you a little bit this week. I'm going to give you a situation or a scenario. Oh, good stuff. That I'm in, which Easy. I would find myself in quite regularly, mm-hmm. and These I want nice areas. you to uh, suggest what I should be drinking in those scenarios. All right? Done. Wow. Okay. Driving a car. Yeah. Not out. Water. <laughs> <laughs> Water is preferable. Okay. So number one, uh, you are down by the beach in quite a nice restaurant. Um, you've had a little entree of oysters, and you're about to have a main course, which is seafood. What's your go-to there? Because for me, my head just instantly goes to like Riesling because... Oh, mate. We got some open right now. This is what we're drinking. That's what you should this be having. The sherry. The sherry. Yeah, 100%. 100%. This is like seafood city. Like it's yeah. it's literally made and specifically has to be made in a part of Spain that is like super close to the ocean. And it's only moderated by cool winds off the ocean. Mm-hmm. So it is ocean born and ocean aged. It spends its entire life like so looking at the ocean. Um, and you know that saltiness that refreshment works so well with seafood like it's definitely like if you're looking for something a bit different this is definitely what you should be having with um, your seafood and when you so to me having sherry on the show uh, the wine tasting that we did recently was a bit of an eye-opening experience because to me sherry's always just sort of been like um, granddad's drinking port grandma's drinking sherry yeah, so you're talking about Pedro mm-hmm. you know, like completely different like still sherry it's just like a completely different style. So what what is sherry? Because it wigged me out that you guys were talking about sherry being a great varietal. I thought it was like a style. Sherry is a place. Okay. So it's 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 the, it's the same champagne thing. Champagne oh. isn't champagne unless it's from champagne. So it's like sherry has to be from the small town of Jerez. Okay. Um, and then there's different parts of sherry. 99.999% of it is made from a grape called Palomino, mm-hmm. which is heralded for being the most boring grape variety mm-hmm. in the entire planet. Like it's literally, it's it's enjoyed for its lack of flavor. It's yeah, you know moderate out, like you know can ripen pretty well at moderate and alcohols fucking with no acid, with zero acid. It's <laughs> if you made it into a dry white and did nothing to it, it would literally taste the most boring neutral wine. Yeah. But what they do with it in uh, in Spain is basically age it in for long, long periods of different. And there's two different forms of aging. There's by bi- what they call biological and oxidative. So oxidative is just when there's it spends enough time with the oxygen, it develops those kind of nutty um, characters that are you know not necessarily what's in this wine, but more like walnut and things like that. And then you've mm. got ox- uh, so then you've got biological aging is what we have here, which it's spe- like. When Palomino gets to a certain ripeness, it sits at a certain um, pH range where it's actually able to grow what we call a layer of floor yeast, which is this basically what they call a veil of yeast that protects the wine enough from oxygen so it doesn't spoil, but also integrates it enough so it actually changes the flavors of the wine, which gets this kind of like cashewy, salty thing that's really interesting. And then mm. that's the dry styles. Yeah. So that's what we're drinking right now. We're drinking the dry styles, which are, you've got Fino, you've got Manthania, which is mm. the, basically Fino from a particular place. And then you've got the oxidative styles, which are Amontillado, Oloroso, Oloroso um, and really, really interesting, different, completely different styles. And then, you know, these dry styles can then turn into those oxidative styles, which is Oloroso, um, oh no, sorry, Amontillado, um, which is particularly interesting. Um, but then you've also got what we know traditionally as sherry, which is either Pedro Jimenez or pale cream sherry, which is like back sweet and palomino. Yeah, so that'll be your generally, because my idea of sherry before we were drinking this stuff was it was very much so like a sweet style, yeah. mm. desserty sort of thing that you'd be having, as opposed to this, which. You know, you and I both confused it for really expensive orange wine on the show. Which I'm so frustrated myself (laughs) about. (laughs) It's unfortunate. So uh, you'd recommend this with seafood, but you wouldn't recommend the sweeter styles. No, no, no. So words to look out for on the menu are... Fino and Manthania or like Manzanilla. 
if yeah. you really wanted to pronounce every syllable. Yeah, if you, if you want to pronounce it like in a <laughs> English, like Aust- Australian way, yeah, it's manzanilla. 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 Um, it's you know it's yeah. a Spanish thing. The, the Z is is like a th- and the L's are silent. Um, but yeah, like that's what you'd be looking for because it's like salty, mm. refreshing. So this is a really good option. But if you're looking for um, unfortified white wines, I um, mean, champagne's fucking awesome. Mm. Semillon's awesome. Riesling's awesome. Vermentinos and Fiano, like really lean Fianos. Pick pool. Pick pool. Awesome. Yeah, 100%. Pick pool's um, a great one. Things like that. Any this like high acid, clean white wine. Fantastic. Mm. Uh, next one. Um, unoaked as well. Unoaked. Fuck oak. Mm. Don't yeah. want oak no, with no. seafood. Not really, no. Uh, yuck. It's like, it's, like, it's like, do you want milk with your seafood? Like, no, you wouldn't do no, that. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, fish milkshake is pretty famously going off like a mis- <laughs> fish milkshake. So no, you don't need that. <laughs> um, next one I've got for you is it is uh, the middle of winter in Australia. You've got a few people coming around to it's watch. It's like, like 25 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's muggy freezing. outside. No. So it's mm. middle of winter in Australia. Uh, mm. Football's on. It's a mm. Friday night. Mm-hmm. And you're having six or so people around. And you don't want to drink beers that night. So you decide that you want to drink wine. But you've got a wide spectrum of people coming. So you need something that's a bit of a crowd-pleasing, yep. easy drinking. But it's winter, so you might not necessarily want to go to that chilled red, chilled mm-hmm. white sort of mm-hmm. thing. What's that nice sort of crowd-pleasing Ooh. drop for winter? It's a t- slightly harder one, I reckon. Because like, like I'm tempted to say... Like, the first thing straight off the bat was, like, Grenache. I was like, like just choose a Grenache. Everyone's kind of kind of like that. But you do need to commit to, like, a red or a white, right? Mm. And I thought, well, what if it was white? I went, Chardonnay. Chardonnay's not everyone's cup of tea. Mm. My bias says Fiano, a textual white mm. that you can have out of the fridge. That'd be great. Um, you know, Riesling can be a little bit too abrupt for people. So, yeah, I'd be sitting in that sort of, like, textual white space that is maybe not oaked. I know I would prefer something oaked. Mm. In winter, yeah. In winter, yeah, 100%. But um, not, like, if you're talking about, like, crowd please a random sampling of six people, there's probably plenty there that don't like oaked, oaked wine. Yeah, it's a fair point. I mean, look, saying there's random six people, so you, you, you can't make everyone happy all the time. But safest bet, yeah, uh, like, grenache sort of... Yeah, that sort of high-toned aromatic thing. What do you reckon? I, so, like, to talk different codes of football... Um, yes. American football, you've got like you, you're looking for super fatty like wings, like like the, the, I'm I'm thinking about the food you're gonna eat. Fair. In America, you're thinking like buffalo wings, blue cheese sauce. Mm. I want yeah, I'm thinking texture white. Mm. Like that's that's gonna be the perfect pairing for that. Um, that's probably what I drink in America f- compared with American football. Mm. Yeah. If I'm going to you know Europe and we're talking about the original football, yeah, um, with no hand involvement whatsoever. Um, I'm thinking. Well, like it depends what country you're in, and the, yeah, if you're Yanti. thinking in like if you're in actual like mainland Europe, they've got you know a great swathe of different wines that are from that place that perfectly pair with the food that goes there. So really, we're talking about England, mm. and you're thinking like rich, hearty meals. I'm thinking like something rich and decadent, which kind of ties into the Australian thing, which is you want something that is crowd pleasing, that's kind of ochre and then pairs with it. Like what? Meat pie. Meat pie, pizza, yeah. shit like that. Yeah. I'm thinking like, and I did this and I had a fucking great time and it's going to sound weird, but especially for this show, but Pepper Jack Shiraz. Hey, I've drunk plenty of Pepper Jack in my time. I don't tell you guys about it because Works I feel well. like I'll be lambasted. It's... But. it's oh, so, no, I have so much respect for Pepper Jack as a wine. I think it's so fucking delicious and crowd pleasing, and it's like it's under twenty five dollars. It's great. Pepper Jack rules. I'm, I'm, you know, I know this is kind of like a wanky wine show, but Pepper Jack fucking rules. Unap- unapologetically a fan of Pepper Jack. Unapolog- unapologetically, it kind of comes. It, like I don't look and dress like someone who would be like, yeah, fuck, pe- fuck yeah, Pepper Jack. I'm so down for Pepper Jack. Yeah, I don't mind Malbec. Kind of keen on Malbec at the moment they're sort of like like peppery styles of Malbec mm. if you look really. like I guess if you want to break the mould I'm thinking like someone that's really cloud cloud breezing is going to work for everybody like Pepper Jack works for not going to break someone's brain for what they actually know mm. but Malbec is like you know breaking the mould a little bit left of centre and I think that would absolutely go down a tree uh, different tact though you know you said you've decided you don't want to drink beer but you're after maybe something beer like what about like Prosecco's like, what about a, a completely inoffensive, basic sparkling? I just think there's too much fizz. 
I just get sick of the amount of fizz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the sugar too as well. Bloated. And you just get that like that uh, sparkling wine headache when yeah. you have too much fizz. Like, yeah, not man. Into a couple of four and twenties and some prosecco. I'm, I'm exploding. Yeah. Uh, jump on a trampoline, you're gonna have a weird time. <laughs> Very <laughs> strange time. <laughs> um, what about? Some would say a fish milkshake. <laughs> some would say. Um, what about? It is date night. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. You're the person in the pairing that is more into wine. And maybe mm-hmm. it's a little bit early on in a relationship, and you're just trying to like feel out, mm-hmm. feel out where they're going to go. So you you're going out on this first or second date or whatever it is, and you need to figure out what sort of wines they're going to be into. You can get three glasses across the evening oh. for them to have. Wow, good stuff. Which cool. three glasses do you go with to go? All right, so here's option one, here's option two, here's option three. Which of these do you like the most? And then from there, you can sort of start to tailor going down a path. This what would be good. the three sort of starting points? So I'm assuming this is like kind of early on in the relationship, but you're like established enough where you're kind of considering, do we want to keep going with this? Yeah. Yeah. Are we yeah. compatible for the long term? <laughs> yeah, because if you don't like this wine, no, it's not. Yeah, it's not like the <laughs> deal breaking. You're not that much of a wine nerd. It's like. Yeah, we're going to see each other a few more times, and okay, so like one of the things that we've spoken about originally is that like I like I fancy my wines. You want to get more into them. Yep. I'm okay. trying to figure out how the next time I come mm. over to your house and I bring a bottle of wine for us to drink, it'll be a bottle that uh, you'll enjoy. I've got enjoy. experience with this, uh, no doubt, Mister Winemaker. Well, no, I mean it's not like I go on many dates these days, but um, when I first met Laura, mm. Laura didn't drink wine. Really, she didn't drink at all. Now, wow. now for those playing at home, you would know that you know. Or we'll soon learn that Laura is actually our CEO. She's the head boss. She yes. she runs the whole whole shit. Chief, yeah, yeah, head of operations as Big well, wine making. Yeah, uh, she. I was uh, introducing her to wine mm. uh, gradually through a you know like a slow controlled process of like this is Moscato, this is Riesling, like sweet Riesling, and then you know moving so on and so forth. Same thing you did to me about three years ago. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Beautiful trajectory that we're on. But Henry, what, do you have a kid on the way? I know, yeah. <laughs> but what happened, though, uh, I think it was like maybe we were three months into dating, and uh, I won this, this, this competition. It was like a blind tasting competition, pin the tail on the donkey. It was specifically Italian wines, uh, and it was like 150 wines blind tasted over the course of three days, and basically the winner takes all, you know, all expenses paid trip to Italy to visit a whole bunch of um, uh, yeah, different producers over there. Um, and I brought Laura with me. And it was literally, you fly into Malpensa, uh, uh, Milan, and like you're out in Barolo. And she was like, we had like, you know, an all-star studded lineup of wineries to visit, like, you know, 15 to 20 different producers all through Barolo. Yeah. And so she's been catapulted from Sweet Riesling all the way through to big rich the most tannic wines you know on the planet yeah like face stripping tannin how long had you guys been together before you took her to italy three months whoa wow hey yeah it was pretty impressive (laughs) that's very impressive (laughs) all expenses Um, paid trip nicely done. it was pretty cool and i looked i I looked like a bit of a badass at that point 100 percent. i tell you what though um you know, we came back to Australia, and and this is after going from top to toe, like from from you know Piemonte down to Sic- Sicily, and back. Um, like she was drinking Kunawara Cab, like you know, it didn't even have enough tannin. Um, you know, so I do wonder whether or not the the approach of kind of going like two three and then try to tailor instead of just going to go like go straight to the extremes, be like, all right, we're going to do like. German Riesling bone dry. We're going to do Nebbiolo Barolo, and then some like oaky shard in the middle and be like uh you're with a sink or swim yeah i mean they'd have to be game like, laura's a very game person i don't think that's applicable from going like you should just try the craziest thing is like not i'm going to take you to the place where it's from yeah like, <laughs> you know, you've got, like, like you go to a place and you get like those like almost roast into glasses like, i had this wine when i was there i had this amazing time and it was a whole yeah. different thing yeah. that's what i guess like it can transport the love for those different things mm. um the other thing like is- if you're just at like a restaurant down the street on the parade or whatever and just be like here's a barolo here's some burgundy and you're just like and gents oh. you're just gonna have to pick up your game yeah all right, <laughs> win, a, win a contest yeah didn't win a contest what about well no what's your what, so brendan's going the Extreme. masochistic yeah like, oh look I, trial I, by fire i think for me if i'm going thank you 
um, if I'm going for wine, if they want to get, I guess, take it out of the dating thing. If they're going to get it to the, these are the wines you should like if you're going to, if you want to get into wine. Yeah. Or the wines you'll probably enjoy if you're going to get into wine. Like, and I'd just go sparkling white red. Like those would be the three wines. Sparkling, I'd start with like a, a pretty decent, like, you know, non-vintage big house champagne, like a Paul, like a glass of Paul Roger. Yeah. I think that's, a, you know, fuck, who doesn't like good champagne? Yeah, but yeah, well, that's it. Like if she doesn't, right? It's game over. I'm out. Yeah. If you don't like champagne, I'm fucking out. Like, like, is this is it important for you to actually tailor? Is it even important? Like, don't don't even. This is still. It's all a test. Everything's a test. But it's not about for me to tailor, figure out the perfect wine that that other person's yeah. drinking. It's actually I'm on a date right now. Like it is like go time. I want to find out if you like the stuff I like. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose that's definitely part of it. With wine, it's slightly different because you know. Uh, for me, I, I I can count on one hand the amount of six packs of beer I've bought in my life. Like I'm very much so. Like, really? Yeah. Buy a carton. Like. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Like it's yeah. This sorry. This is glad I understood that. Different on the other side. Wow. But like, buy a carton, right? So when I go to a restaurant, I get a very similar mentality where I go, we could sit around here buying wine by the glass, but like, don't we all want a bottle of wine? And it's going to be more cost effective for us. And. Oh, man. For me, having someone having someone that I'm going to be drinking with regularly, if you're dating, it'd be great to find some common ground. I, there's been studies done on this that it's actually stronger relationships are built around joint hatred rather than joint love. So mm. maybe you could just go the opposite spectrum and just kind of like all the things that you all hate, right, give it to them. That's it. We're gonna and have, you, you can't lose. You we're going to have lose. sparkling Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. We're going <laughs> to <laughs> <we're gonna laughs> have exceptionally mousy something or other. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. if they go, oh man, I really love this. Firstly, you win, right? You kind of go, well, we're not meant to be together. Or you win by every time that you get a glass of that stuff put in front of you, you can give it to someone. Yeah. It's not a bad shout. Uh, Find out more information. No, nah, I'm going I'm going sparkling. I'm, I'm going like a glass of Roger, like a, a texture of white wine without oak, like a Fiano or something like that. And then a red, I'm going like a Grenache. Yeah. I think bang, that, bang, bang. I think they're yeah. two very viable options. If you happen to have won a all expenses paid trip to a wine region, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, pull it out, pull it out. Take yeah. them there and just put them through the ringer. But if you're just at a restaurant, yeah, I think that's potentially a more realistic way of going about it, Noah. <laughs> to be fair, I agree hundred and ten percent with what Noah actually answered. <laughs> that's the yeah. correct answer. Yeah, I just wanted to mention I won a contest about fifteen years ago. Yeah, so they're pulling out a contest win. No, but it's a, it's a, like I just think the approaches are, are distinct and different, right? Because like one is about how how can you possibly tailor your decision making to please the other person, whereas my approach is more like I need to bring this person up to speed. <laughs> Get on my level. Yeah, yeah, but you know, like you've tried that with me with Nebbiolo, and I don't like Nebbiolo, but we're still mates. Like it doesn't mean it's the end. Yeah, of yeah but you haven't been to Barolo yet. <laughs> no, no, I'm yeah, invited to yeah. actually. <laughs> It's a whole different thing. Haven't had the right nab yet, man. Yeah, one day. We've had some recently that I haven't been too bad, but yeah, it's still not my thing. Getting there. Um, Now, something else I wanted to talk to you about is uh, obviously we've been drinking a lot of wine together for the past. How long have we been doing this? Two years, Mm -hmm. realistically, two or so years. Yeah, I think Mm -hmm. I think it's two years. Has been, and you know, I've now gotten to the point where there's probably like seven or eight great bridals that I'm like relatively across their existence mm-hmm. and not can't pick them out of a lineup but if someone's like oh what do you know about Gamay I'm like I know three things about Gamay compared to zero X amount of years yeah, ago yeah okay question I have for you is where should I or someone who might be in my similar sort of stage of drinking where should we be looking for new things to try in 2024 because like we good. we recently had a Grillo on the show, mm-hmm. which is something that I've got very little experience with and very little exposure to, and I loved it. I thought that was fantastic. So do I go down the path of exploring what Grillos are like, you know? Well, I mean, if you're looking for the place where you should find these new grape varieties, there's two suggestions. One is the Wine for the People YouTube channel. <laughs> They're uh, already here, and, uh, <laughs> They're already here. <laughs> We've got them. Well, then, was. you know, it's a moot point. Uh, different drop. That that It's in their name. Different mm. drop if you're in uh, Australia. If you're in Australia, yeah. Um, you know, it's a little. It's that one's a little bit tricky. They're they're, they're lax. Um, it's part of the reason why we started the channel in the first place. You know, keep in mind there's, there's not really a lot of um, publications or uh, for people typically that are like along your journey of, of mm. wine drinking. They're not 
they're all around your age and yeah. it's not like you you're going out buying decanter magazine no, uh, and trawling through the the reviews to see like what the next big napa cabernet is going to be like that's just it's not used which means that wine's not even be speaking to you in any way shape or form so there does there's some really good publications noble rot is a fantastic one um that that we're sort of big fans of um but in terms of like a source of new so that's a tough one i was the question i was actually asking was do you have any great re- varieties to recommend me trying but i do appreciate the publications well, as well like well like i think it's always like what are you into right now and what could you enjoy next well at at the moment i'm quite enjoying uh I, i'm I'm getting away from the spicier side of red wine. I'm yep. enjoying more mellow reds. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of the whites, I've actually come around to oaked white wine a mm-hmm. lot more, but okay. I still don't want it to be that sort of... There's a certain like characteristic that feels like the barrel's been hot, like hot oak. Toasted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. toasted. So I think they're the two things that I'm sort of into at the moment. And then obviously the world of sparkling, like sparkling wine... I, drink but like I, I feel like i drink it just as like a it's almost like, like a beer a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 i don't think about it like much. the problem with sparkling wine is it's like what, what if you don't drink it like this it's like pet nat or champagne and there's a couple of things in the middle it's like prosecco is prosecco you you understand what prosecco is for and you've drunk it you've kind of achieved prosecco there's no real heights that you can gain more from prosecco i guess in sparkling wine um you know you've got pet nat just you know, if you like it, just keep drinking it. It's fine. Mm. Um, and then, if you like, if you really want to enjoy like great sparkling wine, you can go to Champagne. But you don't know, like. I, I'm probably you know in a similar point. Like, I don't want to spend a hundred bucks a bottle on a glass of sparkling wine. No. Like that's just the Champagne pricing. It's just it's putting people out of actually enjoying that thing. I I would challenge you to spread your uh, I guess viewpoint of wine and sort of the exploration of wine rather than by variety but by place. By the, by the simple admission of, of like, if you go, you know what, I'm discovering Chardonnay. It's like, well, Chardonnay can be many things, man. Like, like you know, and if you if anyone ever says that they don't like Chardonnay, it's really just a simple case of you simply haven't tried enough because it's just You don't so like the winemaking it. styles of the Chardonnays you've had. And it also, like, like, wine as a variety, you know, literally kind of going, this is the variety of wine that I'm drinking right now, kind of presents wine, I think, a little bit out of context. Like the variety, like in some some in some senses, it makes sense. Like Pinot. Well, if someone says that like Pinot, they're probably telling me more than Pinot. They're probably telling me they will probably like many forms of Grenache as well. Mm. I think it would be far more interesting for me to say, you know what, uh, Henry, if you're kind of like trying to expand the world of wine, you need to look at South Africa. That no, yeah, that's kind of what no. I was kind of going to go down. Besides the sparkling path, because you can't really do much more than sparkling, but like you're you're into this like more mellow like less spicy aspects of reds and you're into the kind of more textural styles of whites not necessarily super oaky chardonnay so with white mm. wines you should definitely go to, Char- uh, to south africa mm. 100 well, austria maybe austria, austria for fun. sure yeah absolutely no. like you know dry styles like kind of riesling ish but not but reds like zweigelt yeah know, blau juicy, frankish yeah. awesome uh, no? absolutely um, i was also thinking spain Hell yeah. Yeah, Spain would be like, those are the kind of places you should yeah. definitely start flirting with. Yeah. And I think at the moment, like particularly in the world of wine, everyone's really looking for something comfortable and they're still just going to the more classical mm. things. Everyone wants the same thing. So we're not seeing many um, options for great alternative regions that aren't like the big ones. Even yeah. though Spain's a big one, it's the I think it's the largest producing wine region in the world next to France. Um, or maybe even Pip, Pip France at some stage. Um, but like there's such great um stuff to find there but we're just not seeing very much of it here because everyone's like i'm just going to drink adelaide with chardonnay yeah it's it, it's a good point you bring up the idea of approaching rather than attacking a varietal attacking a region because there is a, that probably do you would you say that you get more characteristics in a wine from the region or oh, like would you find question. it would you find right, it easier to pick a Spanish wine or nah. to pick a Grenache overall? Uh, I, I I think it is way easier to pick pick country and region than it is to pick variety. I think variety is something that is best treated after that. Like if I'm looking at something going, wow, this is totally Italian, this is totally Piemonte, and therefore I'm like, 
well, it pretty much narrows it down to three red varieties, for mm. example. It's only after that, you know, do I start to really kind of question that. That's, but I, I go place first. Uh, I think it also, I think that depends on variety. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so if I can smell, I can smell a wine and go, that is Riesling. Mm. You know, Riesling's a really good one. It's like you mm. smell it, you go, oh, it's super floral, it's citrusy. Like, okay, it's probably Riesling. Stands out. And then you go, sweet Germany. Like, you know, then that kind of, or dry, could be Australian, could be, yeah, a whole bunch of different That's things. I go, I, I, I don't do that. I, I think I, just different approaches. It's, yeah, it's totally different approaches. And it's a bit of like an, 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 a chicken or egg scenario because it kind of happens at such lightning speed now mm. that, um, and, and, and as you've seen from the show, we can also be entirely incorrect. Oh, we can, we can, yeah, we can yeah, yeah. at lightning speed, go to entirely the wrong conclusion Absolutely. but like say the reasoning example i'd go oh this is like really sweaty and vegetal it seems phenolically developed it feels old world um you know taste of the acid line and by then like if i'm already there i'm already largely concluding where it is because it can like it can only be so many things after that um but i definitely find like and, and i get thrown up like the, the the foil to my approach is really like if something's slightly bready as mm. we actually experienced today um, you know, I'm like, this is old world. And it wasn't. It was from fucking Margaret River. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it is not a perfect approach, but I do find I think it's I think it's important to remind people that wine is of a place. It's mm. not it's not just a variety. Yeah, well, I suppose that was the thing that sort of when I first started working for you, that was one of the big sort of things that clicked into place about the the difference between wine and other drinks is that you are very much so telling like you can make like you know south coast pale ale by pirate life for example one of the local mm. breweries here they mm. make a beer that's like tuned to the south coast of uh south australia and you're meant to be drinking it in that and that's yeah they're like thinking you mean, about the place and yeah. thinking about an ad product and getting to there versus wine telling the story of the vineyards that it's come from and giving a sense of locale in the actual liquid itself is just I don't know, it's an interesting way of storytelling yeah. through liquid uh, yeah to. i think it's also worth noting there's like you know wine isn't exclusive in that it is the majority of the in the particularly in the drinks industry of like to communicating the place but there's other places that other styles of drink that do that well there are some you know parts of beer like you know that do that whiskey mm. sake a whole bunch of different things but yeah for sure that i think that is the great thing about wine it, it, it really it sells itself by the place more than anything else so it is entirely <clears throat> entirely possible and, and indeed it happens for you to have whiskey of australia and not a single thing inside that bottle has originated from australia right you can, you can import because the the rules surrounding whiskey same thing with beer like rules surrounding whiskey is where it's distilled has nothing to do with the ingredients has nothing to like you can actually get completely fermented whiskey wash imported across not that they would do that they would they would import the grain which they do they import the yeast uh the water would come locally but it's heavily treated you know completely fined to within an inch of its life yeah. to, to deliver the perfect parameters for a very controlled process and there are outliers to this but it's just like whiskey's whiskey provenance is really quite different. I'm not saying it's illegitimate; it's just very different to wine. Mm. You you simply cannot, uh, at least in Australia, and there are sort of some really funky mm. rules in some winemaking regions around the world surrounding this. But like, if if it says wine of Australia, it has to be from Australia. If it says wine of like Adelaide Hills. I think it's 85% of it must come from the Adelaide Hills. Grapes but, have been grown in the Adelaide Hills. But it also needs to come from, like, I think the other 15% can't come from outside the state or something. Like, there are sort of sub-rules of what to how you can, like, other stuff that you can put outside of that. Like, we can't bring in, say, American wine, I believe, into Australia and call it wine of Australia. Like American grapes. Yeah, but you can in Thailand. In Thailand, you can bring something like 50 or 60% of your wine from a completely different country, blend it into your own and still call it like wine of Thailand. So there are some really weird rules out there. That's strange. But it's just always been a thing with wine because wine is literally grows on a vine, it gets crushed and fermented as opposed to like whiskey and beer, any grain-based anything that needs to go through extra steps. You've got to convert the starch to sugars. Uh, you've got to heat it up, you know, you've got mashing profiles, hop profiles in the case of beer. You've got so much intervention that happens in the way to generate something that actually never really is traditionally spoken of place. It's spoken of conviviality, spoken of like bringing people together and just yeah. having a social drink. Wine's been that and others and so much more. That and more. Yeah, there you go. Um, and then 
One other thing that I just wanted to touch on today, it was something that I was thinking about off the back of, uh, we were talking the other week about how Dad bought a bunch of uh, Grange. Oh, yeah, and he's, you're going to have a great fun. 70th great coming 70th. up. It's going to yeah. be huge. The question I had for you is, if you today, like, so me, I'm about to turn 30 in a couple of years. If I was to think... Yeah, surprise, right? Total man-child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still in my 20s. What's up? Um... If I am thinking, all right, I want to drink something at my 50th, I want to drink something at oh, my cool. 70th, I don't, like, yeah, sure, Grange, whatever, but, like, I don't want to go out, like, what is something that you could buy now at a price that isn't Ooh. stupid, like, that mm. isn't prohibitively expensive to someone in their 20s, but you could then sell her appropriately and have something that's a little bit sort of cool and special and... 30, uh, 20 to 30 years old. I have old. my answer for this, but I want, no, I want to know no, Noah's first. No, no, I want to know yours. No, 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 no. Uh, Hunter Bell Semyon. Interesting. It's fucking cheap. In, you yeah, can buy yeah. dirt cheap Hunter Valley sell, Sam that's very good for $25. And you can sit on that and it will last for minimum 30 years. Yep. Mm. Especially now, most of it's under screw cap. Mm. You will sit on that for fucking ever. It will go. Um, and also um, residual sugar Riesling. Mm. Like those, mm. will, those will keep um, for the length of the Flemington Strait or whatever other long distance. That thing. is that is an incredible analogy. I love that one. Yeah, it's just it just it, you can get it for great answer, like great prices, keep it for a long time. Um, like sorry, what the fuck? Um, you can get it for really good prices, and you can keep it for a long time. And it, you know the corks are going to fail because most of the products are like under screw cap, um, or like Diam or something like that. And I don't know, like like Reds. Like uh, Kunawara Cabernet, mm. like that's always you know very um, well priced now because it's kind of like Cabernet's really re- retracting in the Australian market and the markets with the particular regions that are doing well for that particular variety are doing well in Margaret River um, and also Victoria. They're, they're the kind of more sexy, cool places to buy Cabernet in Australia. So Kunawara is kind of receding. So you can get some really great wines at really good prices. Internationally, like if you don't want something from Australia, um, I can't think of uh, champagne. Like champagne yeah. ages for a really long time, and even like local sparkling, like just good traditional method sparkling from champagne varieties would do really well. Mm. So that's what I'd be going for. I mean, Hunter Valley, Hunter Valley Sam's a good, bargain. good answer. That's is the bargain. Yeah, that's the biggest disparity I think, like, like in terms of something that can last thirty years and be really, really tasty and. <clears throat> charge like an arm and a leg for it. My my vote goes to Voltolina. Voltolina, yeah. Which is Chiavanesca. Nebbiolo from Alpine, a big uh, in Italy. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So you can sit on that for twenty, thirty years. What what are the? Uh, I, I vehemently believe that uh, Voltolina, like, because that's that's the other thing. It's like you could at this stage, there are people that have kept like uh, Hunter Valley Sem, for example, for. 30 years and it is delicious it is mm. fucking amazing it's still 25 bucks yeah but you're going to keep Voltolina in 30 years time guaranteed you could probably sell that case for probably about 30 grand like it's it is so undervalued on the basis of like just how much is made how it's made um a little bit of global warming will go a long way in that region uh, like it's just so many things I'm willing to bet it's going to be like a massively restricted scarce market as well as being high tan and high acid and will last no you look like you've got something to say I guess like you, you you're you looking at this as not you're, tr- not you're not trying to sell this you're trying to drink this yeah I mean look it, it's one of those things where drinking something that has aged well both yeah. Uh, in bottle but then also in the marketplace feels it's like a <laughs> yeah nice, exactly you know yeah, I mean? yeah it's like, like this one now is worth like yeah, 100 grand I love yeah. a bargain so like I, <laughs> I want that experience of my dad being able to sit around going bought this 70 bucks I tell you what, can't tell you what to pay I, for I, it I'll tell now. you what if, like, you, if you, buy some, you bought some like really great Hunter Sam like some of these businesses won't exist in 30 years because they're like no one's selling Hunter Valley Semi on anymore yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of wineries in the region going up for sale so it might even exist but yeah that being said like Voltolina like Alpine Nebbiolo definitely um, has great Claire, value Claire potential Riesling is another big one mm. like just just there's a sea of Clare Valley Riesling out there that's not expect, like most people will drink it really young but it can age 20-30 years quite comfortably I just have patience for that 
I know. I just keep cracking. It's too delicious. I, I keep cracking it's too into delicious it. yum. <laughs> so what's the what's the Voltolina going to set me back these days? Oh, we've had them on the show for like sixty high bucks minimum for a, a for bucks? a bottle retail. Yeah. We've had some, for, I thought, cheaper than that. Something like the Sandro Phase or something were like 30, high 30s? Or was I, have I got that I, wrong? I reckon we're in the 45, 50 area. Yeah. Um, and they're only getting more and more expensive as the popularity And ha- how up. much did your old man buy that Grange for back in the day? Yeah, like 60, 70 ish bucks. Yeah. So around a similar price point. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty bullish on Voltolina. I, I barely own any. But it's should, I should Why? like back this. I <laughs> yeah, don't know. Put your money to be, your like to be honest, like from the stuff that I've tasted from Voltolina, I haven't seen the stupid longevity of something like a Barola or a Barbaresco. I've seen like these light, pretty things that I want to drink now. I haven't seen like the future. Have, have you had a chance to see any sort of like Barolo from the 50s and 60s? God no. no. <laughs> yeah, because that's things like most people see Barolo now, thinking that's how Barolo always was, and Barolo was exceptionally pretty. In fact, in many instances, uh, Barolo was majority Barbera. This oh, is yeah. before the DOCG came in, and yep. there was a lot of people, even to this day, that are really against that DOCG being 100% Neb. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I kind of look for something that, like, the thing that drives value, and this is really, like, this is a technical aspect. I love the taste. I love the flavor. Mm. You know, I love Nebbiolo, and I love old Nebbiolo. Um, I also know that value in the wine industry is driven by scarcity mm. and the story. And I, I think Voltolin has a really, really good story. That'd be, um, that'd be the other thing if you're looking for... Uh, if, if you do flip it to the investing side of things with wines, you can be a very cynical person and try and pick out places around the world that are currently making wine that, due to the climate changing, will no yeah. longer be able to make the wine that they are currently making. So mm. the scarcity of it will skyrocket like it, it uh, just won't be a thing anymore yeah, no but if they can't make wine then how are they going to have a future market and i know like like bordeaux's you know doing some really cool things i'd actually look to look at the opposite end of the spectrum like and that's what most people are doing so uh, in, uh Bur- burgundy burgundy winemakers champagne winemakers are buying land in hokkaido and they're buying land in uh like southern france uh, southern uh, england um, and planting England has just gone through its biggest vintages it's ever had on record, and there are plantings every year. They breaking records in terms of areas planted. So, what they're doing is they're going, well, where is on the cold fringe of winemaking that has really good, interesting soils mm. that is we know is just simply going to get warmer? I'd be buying from those places because to establish like England's a bit of a funny one, but like like northern islands of of japan like the wines aren't that expensive just buy them now sit on them when they do blow up they most likely will you know that's when you make that that value the original... i wouldn't be i wouldn't be looking at stuff from like southern france right now and be like you know what we gotta like load up on this stuff mm. like oh uh, this it would get scarce but yeah which there won't be anymore like there's yeah, no but... scar- like there's no scarcity which means that. they wouldn't be in the market though building their brands and being relevant and stuff they'd just be old like there's plenty of great wines from from places that that no longer make wine like algeria for example makes a shitload of wine but like it used to predominate wine sales it's the the most consumed import was the most consumed imported wine in france but Mm. now it's bottom dollar and it's just gotten too hot yeah but it's also like if you had a um an amazing heritage you know, like what they view as an iconic wine brand. And so if you go to like Chateauneuf de Pop and get like an amazing brand from there that's making epic Grenache now, and they're worried about the ripening and the over alcoholization mm. of those particular things. If you had like one of the, the gr- last great vintages and stored that and then sold that in a hundred years, which historians would then document as like one of the last great vintages from that region because the climate got too hot, that would absolutely be scarce. That would be high priced. I don't. I don't know. Like you can like, buy. Like you know, there was a, a resale of a bottle of Dom Perignon from the first vintage that was like you know a quarter of a million. Bucks. Totally, hundred percent. But Dom Perignon's still a thing now. Like if you're talking about some somewhere that gets so hot that they stop. Like like there is no way. Let's say Chateau Neuf de Pop. Let's just say all hell breaks loose. No wine for the last thirty years has been made in Chateau Neuf de Pop. That means an entire two to three generations of wine drinkers have never even heard of this place, and they're the ones with all the money. Mm. So they're not interested That's, in buying. The old people will have the old the money. <laughs> they yeah, will, they will I, hold on to that. Uh, yeah, but like, are they going to want to like? Do they have, for example? I mean, we knew some of the most expensive wine was coming out of Morocco. But right now it's all cheap. Now, if there was a really old vintage from the 1800s of Moroccan wine, even the people who were rich, most of them are dead, they aren't going to want to buy it because Burgundy exists. You know, are they going to want to buy Chateau Neuf de Pop 
if and that's it's a philosophical thing it's more about marketing you need to have they need to still be in the market and still be relevant like madeira is a really good example of this like old madeiras from like the 1700s 1800s mm-hmm. are only getting those prices a because they're oh forgive me i'm like old old yeah because they're old or because they're um uh, and because they're still in the market like madeira still exists and you can go and visit those places like if it got too hot in Madeira, just stopped making wine for twenty years. No one would visit Madeira. Madeira wouldn't even be a thing. The so, value in Madeira just plummets. So I suppose the move is at like a bit of what Noel was saying. Find a wine winery, a wine producer that even if their vineyards in X area are going to go bust, they themselves are at a scale of which they're going to adapt and improvise and move elsewhere or make different grapes or something. Mm-hmm. But then you can have the last variety X from vineyard Y from producer yeah like from the famous producer that seems like the way that you would yeah sort of i mean like I'll, i like bordeaux right now and I'll, bordeaux is already very expensive just bordeaux yeah. in general though would be a really good shout because mm. when when bordeaux is suddenly like 60 percent tariga you know people are going to be like man bordeaux's really changed Had, did you ever try the old bordeaux it's sort of like old bottles of barolo right now finding old bottles of barolo pre-docg that are like majority barbera are just fascinating for nerds mm. You know, but also Barolo is still a big thing today. Yeah. Well, I, look, honestly, what, what we're talking about here, like, it's not a good get rich scheme. To like, do, is, are there people who trade in? Like, I'm, yeah, I know there's people who sell wines, but like, no, I think <laughs> people who trade in it as a commodity, they trade as it as like, like a, stocks. Yep. Yes. They go up and down, selling. Yep. Yeah. It's huge. It is. Huge? It is probably like fifty percent, I would say, of all wine sales in the world. Are actually just bottles getting flipped around between people. Yeah, in the there, 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 are, there, there are like sellers uh, in in like holding areas inside France that just have like all the first growths from Bordeaux, mm. and they never leave that. They never leave. They're in. Per- it's like it's like a facility that is like perfectly set up for maturation of wine, and and that stocks get listed almost like you can buy shares in stocks. You can buy part bottles, shares of a collection. That includes all of these things. Like it's so, amazing. So you're telling me like there is great futures, there is great options on contracts, there is every single financial instrument that you can imagine also exists in the world of wine. There is even uh, uh, NFTs. Like still, in the I world thought of, NFTs were done. Oh they, mate, they, they are not. They have simply evolved and changed. Yeah, it's amazing. There you go. Well, look, that's some fiscal advice for you to wrap up uh, the end of this episode of Spit and Sips. We've run out of Chardonnay, so I think it's probably time that we wrap up the episode, isn't it? Feels like it. I, I have one one scenario I want your help with, yeah, sure. assistance with something something that uh, I read yesterday. Okay. Uh, you have a problem. You 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 are a country. Okay. Okay. And you're faced with a specific issue. You have way too much wine. You have 850 Olympic-sized swimming pools of wine. You have 3 billion bottles of wine and no one's interested in buying it. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Okay, what can you turn wine into that isn't wine? You can make... You can re-distill it, can't you? And make a spirit out of it. You can make some spirits, but that's still a lot of swimming pools worth Re- of wine. Recreate a brandy industry. That's a really smart one. That's what um, the Italians did in the 50s. Make brandy out of it. Grapper industry. Um, uh, it's a good opportunity for us to, to experiment with a new brandy industry because, you know, every single hospitality industry every single hospitality venue in the country is struggling right now so if you give them hey here's this you know spirit that's super cheap um that's a good option but the problem is excise mm. so it's mm. like there's such an opportunity to offer a great value product but the entry point still is too high um well, but it wasn't I mean, really in swimming pools was it you're just talking about the the volume volume of it yeah cool. the volume cool, 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 cool. um so if you if this country is not in the EU, there's a bit of an opportunity in regards to brandy because it is, I believe, China is about to start a inquiry uh, for uh, dumping anti-dumping measures on EU brandy. With brandy is being sold from Europe into China, way too cheap, and so they're about to do what they did to Australia in the wine, uh, when and hike the taxes and kill the market. So we're essentially flogging bad Australian wine to China to get rid of the stuff that we didn't want here is that what happened I mean no officer but but yeah, yeah okay as, so, as an industry it kind of 
like the the, the big way. dogs that were making just far too much Shiraz and the rest of the world didn't want it but they were just like dumping it into China because there were so many people there was a demand for it and they were just you know wines that were you know being sold at a very high price and the rest of the world were getting sold at very low prices over there yeah like 20 mm. cents a litre 20 cents a litre and yet like for high quality wines that are being sold mm-hmm. um, and why didn't wait and China China didn't want that uh, China was offended with the I guess like the fact that we were just using it as a dumping ground for unwanted product and it's like there's economic difficulties because yeah. of that yeah, for sure. politically as well Australia did some really the Australian Prime yeah. Minister at the time did something really yeah, ScoMo, stupid ScoMo put, pissed them off didn't do a great job yeah so we're making brandy without the excess wine are we? is that that's that's a a solution all, all we know is that australia right now has this amount of wine it is this country that has three billion bottles that are sitting in wine storage currently that we believe we have four years worth of stock to supply the domestic and international market every market with with the demand for australia what do you do open new planets <laughs> <laughs> Always be selling. Yeah. Always Find be a selling. new market. Find a new International. Market. Elon, get the rocket. Let's go. <laughs> we... Selling Australian wine to Martians. I love this. Yeah, try and drop the legal age of drinking. Open Ooh, some new market. Oh, that's, that's I mean, uh, exceptionally irresponsible. I mean, America would be a great opportunity. Maybe they can catch yeah, up. Drop, drop it by the, three years to the, the rest of the fucking 18. world. That's, I mean, I'd love to see the lobby groups. I'd love to see the Australian, g'day boys, g'day girls. Yeah. <laughs> hey, college students, do you want to drink some Pepper Jack? <laughs> He's great. <laughs> you can vote, you can shoot a gun, you can buy a gun, you can go to war. Now it's time to drink Shiraz on <laughs> the Riverland. Aussie wines coming to a college campus near you. <laughs> yeah, shit, we've got a lot of wine to sell. Yeah, so we? like like concerns about like like brand like like brand Australia, you know, like just having a sea of this sort of stuff. Do you just get rid of it to protect the brand? What's well, like sunk costs, just dump it in the ocean or something. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Vinegar. Create a vinegar industry. I mean, there's already a vinegar industry, but it's like Balsamic's getting expensive, man. <laughs> balsamic is getting yeah, well, expensive. Yeah, b- b- Have you seen? Yeah, like balsamic decent. is also what? like uh, appellated and much like cheese. Yeah. So it's like that's why it's getting expensive. Like Parmesan's ex- like proper Parmesan Reggiano is fucking expensive too. Um, but I think um, I don't know. Yeah, I think just get rid of it. Just like find a way to distill it into something use it in a whole bunch of multitude multitude of different industries because i think these big companies are just going to have to accept the fact that the the market has moved on they haven't adapted quick enough they were just trying to solve the problem by dumping it all into china and just like seeing what happens um they just got to go all right fuck where the the, it's dead where it's game over rather than just like hoping on bated breath that china opens up again in the next 12 months like that's it, that's the only answer for a lot of these companies. Do you reckon China would turn around and be like, "Oh, guys, we've missed you. Please give us all that back. We're so keen for all your Barossa Shiraz, no. Riverland Shiraz, heavily irrigated, oh, don't feel, hot climate fruit." Don't feel like I'm the person to ask that question. I've got no idea what the Chinese wine market's like. You know, I don't, I don't know either. Um, but Feels like no, the way you're asking the question, but no, I just it just doesn't seem like there's been a lot of thought that's gone into it. Anyway, it was it was my scenario that I thought oh, I'll be interested to see what you guys actually thought mm. would be the right move. Yeah, I mean, like uh, potentially the best thing you can get out of it is a viral clip where it's just like insane winery dumps millions of liters into the oak. <laughs> like that's you know, I can't imagine that's great for the environment. I mean, though. like you know, lo- locally we've got a wave pool happening in Old Tingham in the near future. Maybe it's just like if we can just take McLaren Val Shiraz and make a wave pool. Wine out wave of that. pool, yeah. <laughs> how how does it go if you just is it fertilizer? Does it do much no, for soil? It's horrible because mm. it's so acidic. Mm. Yeah, so like you would need to like take the water out of it somehow. On that note, uh, or, just, or just dump the price, make it fucking cheap. But isn't that what like would that would that that would harm Australia like as an industry, wouldn't it? Like like the brand wine from Australia. Not it we, would harm those companies. Yeah, you'd hope there wouldn't be any sort of collateral damage where people like look, no one wants Australian wine because it's just or at that price point because it's just so cheap. Yeah, but like, how many businesses are it in that kind of space? Like, oh, I, it's I, like four. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like four wineries all run by 
boards of you know company directors yeah. that have all made really shitty decisions. So their companies will fail. Yeah, but if they're the if they're the most established brands in international markets and reflects on, I can see what you're saying with it reflecting on Australian wine. Yeah, but I mean, someone I, I I reckon it wouldn't matter what price it goes down to. No one wants it. Yeah, I mean, if no look, if no one wants it, no one wants. There's it. nothing to be done about it. Get rid of the <laughs> shit. I don't know how you get rid of it, but yeah, like the sea levels are already rising. What's a couple billion liters of wine going to do? Like, it's just, <laughs> it'll be fine. Um, yeah, I, I haven't got anything else. You got anything else no, you want to talk about? No. Nah. Cool. Another episode of Spitting Sips in the Books. Uh, we'll finish off this Chardonnay, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Maybe with a new name, but. We haven't been super. Workshop, in the comments below. Yeah, in the comments below. Yeah, Give publicly named tips. things always go well. Yeah. <laughs> Potty, Potty McPod face. <laughs> <laughs> Whiny McWine face. All right, cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye. Ciao.